It's not good to be lukewarm, is it? Think about food and drink for a moment. Uh, no one goes to a cafe and uh, orders a lukewarm tea or coffee. We either want our coffee or tea piping hot or ice cold. It's the same with our dinners, isn't it? We like our meals nice and hot or out of the fridge, refreshingly cold and chilled. No one wants lukewarm food, lukewarm drinks. And really, the basic message of this letter is that we are not to be lukewarm spiritually. Jesus wants us either to be hot or cold. That's the message of this final letter. And, and perhaps it's the most hard-hitting of the seven that we've read together as a church. Because Jesus has nothing good to say about this church in Laodicea. In fact, he goes as far to say he's going to spit them out because they are lukewarm. It's, it's very dramatic language, very blunt Quite shocking, perhaps, to hear from Jesus Christ about his people. Now, as I've said before, every letter that we read here is for every church in every age. But I think, certainly our prayer should be, as we've read through these letters, well, Lord, what are we to hear from these letters? What are we to be sensitive to? What are we to be encouraged by, what words of comfort should we be receiving, reassurance, but also what words of rebuke do you have for us? Where do we need to repent as the people of God? Some of these letters no doubt will be more relevant than others for God's people today. And I think this letter is perhaps the most relevant for the church in the West in the 21st century. Because it is written to a church in a society very similar to our own. You see, Laodicea was, was a very wealthy city, very rich. It's famous for its banking, its manufacturing of clothing, and it has a famous medical school. That gives you a little bit of background to the city that this, this letter has been written to. It's a very affluent place. It's a very self-sufficient city. Let me give you one example of that. Um, they had their own natural disaster in AD 60. Uh, an earthquake struck the city. As, as happened in some of the other places, the other letters that we've read to. But this city was different because when aid was offered by other places, they turned it down. They said, we don't need your help. You know, we've got what we need. We'll sort this problem out for ourselves. They, they, they were self-sufficient. They didn't need to depend upon others. And so this letter is to a church in an affluent, self-sufficient society. And that's exactly where we find ourselves, isn't it? as a church here in the UK, in the West. And so this is a message we need to hear. It is written to a church like our own, certainly in context. And it's a message we need to remember from Jesus Christ to his church, to his people. Once again, let me emphasize who's speaking here. This is God's word. It's God's assessment of his church. And every letter has begun with that reminder so that we take seriously what what follows, what, what is communicated in these letters. Each one begins by telling us something about the author. And so in verse 14, verse 14 says this, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. This is the only time that the word Amen is used as a title for Jesus. And it's a way of saying Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's promises. He is the let it be of everything God says. This introduction is stressing his faithfulness and his authority. And so we're being reminded here, what what follows is not merely the opinion of men, it's not the assessment of John, it's the perfect verdict of God. Now just to clear up any potential confusion here, when it says Jesus is the beginning of God's creation, it's not saying, well, well, Jesus was created, that in some way he's inferior to God, that he isn't God. That can't be the case when we think about what we've heard already in the book of Revelation because the first chapter has started by giving us a glorious vision of Jesus as God. We've been told he is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. He is eternal, in other words. He is God. This is simply a way of describing Jesus' position. He is the preeminent one. He is the creator, the sustainer of all life, the one on whom all depend. 
it's an important introduction, bearing in mind the context this church are in and the problem they have. Jesus is saying to them, you can't be self-sufficient. You can't go it alone because you depend on me. You are completely dependent upon your creator and upon your savior. Jesus is the source and sustainer of all life. And that's a message this church needs to hear. It's a message we need to hear in an affluent society because that's the temptation. Let's lean on other things. Let's rest on our money. Let's rest on our wisdom, our education. This is a message to lukewarm Christians. And I suppose the question it asks us is, are we lukewarm? Are we lukewarm before the Lord towards him? Now, the remainder of the letter can be split into two parts. In verses 15 to 17, we see how the church in Laodicea was lukewarm towards its God, towards Jesus. But then wonderfully, in verses 18 to 21, we see how Jesus is not lukewarm towards his people. They are lukewarm, but Jesus is not lukewarm towards his people. So first, first verses 15 to 17, God is asking us that question. He's searching us. Are you lukewarm towards me? Jesus gives his assessment in verse 15 of this church. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. They're lukewarm, we're told, in the sentence that follows. Now, a little bit more background on the, on the city here helps us understand why Jesus is using this illustration. You see, the water supply to this city came from two sources. On the one hand, the water to this, to this city came from hot springs in a place called uh, Hierapolis. But also, water came from another direction, from cold, refreshing water in Colossae. And so, this, this hot and cold water would be mixed together as it came together into the city, and it would arrive lukewarm. Now, lukewarm water is, is too cool, cool to heal, and it's too warm to refresh. That's what the water would have been used for in ancient times. You would go to hot springs for healing. You would go to the cold water to be refreshed. The water that arrives in this city is neither. It's sort of useless in that regard for either purpose. And Jesus is saying to this church, you are like the water of your city. You are spiritually lukewarm. That's your condition. Next comes the consequence, verse 16. So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. In other words, Jesus says, you make me sick. You make me sick. He says, I'm going to do exactly what some of us might do. You know, if we pick up a, a, hop, a, a, a cup of tea and find it's lukewarm and we spit it out because it's not as hot as we thought it was. We reject it. it. It's strong language and it's strong language for a reason. It's a graphic picture of the seriousness of their spiritual health. Indifference to Jesus is not a light matter. Jesus says, I wish you were one or the other. I wish you were either hot or cold. That might seem an odd thing to say, doesn't it? Well, why doesn't he just say, I wish you were all hot? I wish you were all on fire for me. To be cold to him is to oppose him. To be hot is to be zealous for him. They're opposites. But they do have one thing in common, the hot and the cold. Both those who are hot and both those who are cold take Jesus seriously. You know, those who oppose him, who are zealous against him, they're taking Jesus seriously. They don't like him. They want to shut him out. They want to uh, close down his word. Why is being lukewarm so bad? Because to be lukewarm is to recognize Jesus for who he is, but not rejoice in him. It's to know about him, but not take him seriously. It's to sit under his word, but be indifferent or apathetic to what you hear. That's why Jesus is so upset. That's why he speaks this way. These Christians take his name, but they're not taking him seriously. Now, why was that? Jesus tells them their condition. He speaks of the cause or the consequence. Next comes the cause, verse 17. 
For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. What's the problem? Prosperity. In their comfort, they have become complacent. They've lost their sense of dependence on Jesus. Their wealth has diminished their love for Christ. I read the story this week of a, a missionary um, from the USA. He was back home. He, he serves in the Middle East, and he was back in the States, and he was sharing amongst churches there, um, as missionaries do, coming back and saying what they're doing and how they can be prayed for. He was encouraging others to join him on the mission field. One man came to him and said, I would love to come, but I've got young kids. It's just too dangerous to go. It's not a safe place to be, f to raise a family with the persecution that we're likely to suffer. You know, I, I would go, but it's just too hard. What did the missionary say in response? He said this, he said, he said to the man, the USA is the most dangerous place to raise your children. He said, the greater danger is here at home because you fail to see the temptation that is before you. The, the alternative challenge that you have that is sapping you of your faith. The greater danger is here, not on the mission field, he said. And prosperity has always been the greater danger to the church historically. Persecution has often sort of fanned the, the flames of the church and it's grown under pressure. But churches have often sort of wilted at times of prosperity because we're tempted to look elsewhere for our security. It deceive, deceives us into thinking, well, we don't need the Lord. It imparts a false sense of self-sufficiency. And that's the problem in Laodicea. They're acting as if they do not need Jesus. They're trusting in their wealth, not in the spirit. They're a self-reliant church in a self-reliant city. They are just simply imitating the community around them. Economically rich, but spiritually poor. Now Jesus sees things differently. He wants them to see their true condition. He says, you think you have everything, but in reality, you have nothing. You have very little. Again, we get a graphic description. He says to them, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Blunt, isn't it? Uh, and cutting. Now, remember, this is a city that's well known for its banks. It's well known for its hospital. It's well known for its clothing. So again, Jesus is touching on things that are very relevant to them sectors of their city that are very important. This is a city of wealth, health, and it's well-dressed. But Jesus says, no, you are poor, you are blind, and you are naked. Appearances are deceptive. Now, think back a couple of churches, the church in Smyrna. That was economically poor, but they're reassured they're spiritually rich. Laodicea is the opposite. It's outwardly prosperous, but inwardly bankrupt spiritually. They're spiritually blind, spiritually naked. Now that's the ultimate humiliation in the ancient world, to be naked. To be dressed in fine clothing is to receive honor. And so Jesus is exposing their nakedness. You are not finely clothed in the sight of God. You are naked, you are not rich, you are spiritually poor. You are not healthy, but extremely sick. Jesus is wanting them to see who they truly are, to see spiritually clearly. Now let's pause for a moment at, at this point. This is not Jesus' final word. And with all of these letters, some of them are very pointed and difficult to read, but they always have a remedy. And they all contain the grace of God. And they're all the fruit of God's love for his people. That's why he's speaking this way. Before we see the solution, let's be searched by the word of God ourselves because the letter is asking us that question. Are we lukewarm towards Jesus? Because we do live in Laodicea. We live in a land of plenty and prosperity in comparison to many parts of the world relative to previous generations. 
We are a wealthy society. We have good health care. You of us are short of clothing. You know, that story this morning of hearing of a church deciding, well, who's going to go to the conference because who's got the shoes? That's just unheard of here, isn't it? In our situation, we're choosing which shoes to take. Perhaps buying new shoes to take because we can. We enjoy many luxuries. We face the same temptation as this church to think that we can cope okay without God. We might not say that. We might still turn up at church. We might still go through the motions of certain things. But what are our lives saying? Our priorities? Where are we putting our trust? Is it in our incomes? Our pensions? Our NHS? Are these things our safety net? first and foremost do we love and pursue wealth and health do we think we can be self-sufficient has our love to the lord grown lukewarm over time is that our problem now what's the evidence well it is our lack of prayer you know, our attitude to prayer says a lot about our spiritual health as individual Christians, as a church. The degree to which we prioritize prayer reveals the degree to which we're really depending on the Lord. Whether we really think we need him or not, or whether we think, well, in our own wisdom we can get by. By our own means we can build our church. Because lots of churches in the UK are active and busy, aren't they? Lots of websites you turn to, there's loads of things happening in churches but how many are really that prayerful? To what extent are we trusting in our own programs, our money, our energy to bring blessing? Where do we turn to when trouble comes? Is prayer the priority? I don't think it is for many of us. And again, I was challenged this week. I had um, a pastor in Pakistan message me a man who was with us for a couple of weeks here in the UK. You may have met him, Robin. He's gone back to Pakistan. He's part of a church there that, that does face persecution. And he messaged me and said that, you know, they just held a six-hour prayer meeting that I think started at nine at night. It finished at three in the morning. Now, it's hard in the UK to get Christians together for half an hour or an hour, let alone six hours. I'm just thinking that's never going to happen here. You know, too often we're giving God the leftovers of our lives. I know lots of us are busy and there are lots of pressures on lives, on our lives, but we often make time for the things that we believe matter. Whether it be our leisure, our hobbies, whatever it might be, many, maybe many good things, but we, it could be our favorite TV programs. Are you prepared to sacrifice those things to seek the Lord in prayer personally or for us collectively? A lack of prayer is one symptom. Another is a lack of commitment. Our attitude to other Christians says a lot about our spiritual health. How often we meet with other believers, worship with other believers, serve within a church. Because it is God's will for us to be part of a community. That isn't easy. And at times we get hurt and we struggle. But it is God's will that we are in community with other Christians. God calls us to use the gifts that we have been given as part of a church. What are we saying if we are just attending church infrequently? Well, I don't really need what you've provided, Lord. You know, I can get by with just turning up periodically. I can go it alone. I've got my Bible. I can turn to you when I need to. Well, actually, it's God's will that you're part of a community, and it's God's will you use those gifts for the sake of others. But we do have a commitment problem in the UK, generally amongst churches. Might be lots of reasons for that, but I think lukewarmness is one of the problems. Why is it that churches are struggling to find leaders? Why is it that church Bible colleges are struggling to find students? Where are the men who are willing to serve? Where are the men who are willing to sacrifice their time to serve the Lord and serve the church? Is it that we've grown lukewarm towards Jesus? I'm throwing out more questions here than perhaps answers. But 
I think this letter asks us those questions for us to pray about, to think about, reflect on. It is a searching letter for the Western church, ourselves included, we're part of that. Now notice this, we might be lukewarm towards Jesus, but Jesus is not lukewarm towards his church. And that's what we see in the second half of the letter, verses 18 to 21. Jesus not only calls out the problem, he cares for his people. All is not lost. Jesus demonstrates his great love and his grace to us. He tells the Laodicean church to buy something, verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Jesus wants them to be rich. He wants them to be healthy. He wants them to be clothed. It pains him to see their condition. But what does he mean by buying these things? This is a strange expression, isn't it? What, what is he calling them to do? What is this gold, these garments, this medicine he speaks of? Well, simply put, each one of these things is an illustration of himself. Each is describing who Jesus is and what he's done for them. He says, See me, savor me. I am more precious than anything else you have or own. Because to have faith in him is to have gold. That's how Peter describes it in his first letter. A faith that will be refined through the heat of trials and tribulations, but it is more precious than any precious metal. To know Jesus is to have gold. That's an illustration often used of God's word in the Bible, particularly in the Psalms. He says, you've got gold. Come and feed from it. Come and receive it. Jesus provides these white garments he speaks of. In Revelation, these, these garments represent the righteousness that he gives. This is Jesus saying to them, your righteousness comes from me. See where your real value and your real worth comes from. Not what you wear on your body, not how well tailored your clothes are, not what others think of you, not what you think of yourselves, but that purity I've clothed you in. Those white robes of righteousness that I have given you in salvation. He's writing to believers here who've grown cold. He's saying, look again at what you've received. And Jesus is the one who gives true sight. Without him, we're spiritually blind. Jesus wants them not only to see their sin, he wants to see them to see him afresh as their savior. He wants to see again the very reason that they're meeting together. He wants them to see truly where their security and their worth is found. He says, it's not in your wealth, it's not in your clothing, it's not in your health, it's in me. Go back to the gospel, he says. Grasp again who I am. Renew your zeal for me. Love me afresh. That's the message. It's quite simple, really, because you've got distracted. You're looking elsewhere. You're running after other things. Love me as I have loved you. Why is Jesus speaking this way? This is a painful letter, I believe, for us to hear. It's blunt. It's condemning. Why is Jesus hurting this church with his words? Why is he hurting us potentially this evening? if you're finding this searching? Well, because he loves us. He is not lukewarm in his affections towards his people. Look at verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. This is Jesus saying, I've not abandoned you. The, these words are the proof, as, as hard as they may be. He's, he's like a parent who, who's disciplining a child, not because it's easy, but because it's necessary because he cares for them. He wants their growth, their maturity. It is good for their health. And so he says, repent, turn around. Return to me. You've lost your way. You've lost your first love. This letter is very similar to the first one. The opening and the closing letters of these seven letters are the most searching for us. He calls them to repent. Don't just turn up at church. Turn your heart to me. Stop being lukewarm towards me. Stop going through the motions. See afresh who I am, what I've done for you. Turn up the heat. Stop being self-sufficient. Be reliant upon me. Don't just know about me. Be zealous for me. 
This is a loving rebuke. It, restoration is the goal of this letter, not condemnation. And notice Jesus is pleading. Look at what he's doing, verse 20. The illustration changes. He's knocking on a door. He's knocking on the door of this church. He's pleading for readmission to his own church. Why? Because he's become an outsider. That's a depressing thought, isn't it? That these Christians are meeting together in his name. But Jesus is saying, well, you, you really put me outside. You, you know, you, you, you don't really love me in the way you once did. He's saying, let me back in, back into your hearts. This verse is often used evangelistically, you know, often applied to unbelievers. You know, Jesus is knocking, let him in. But actually, this verse in context is being addressed to Christians saying, you know, you, you, you've forgotten about me. C can you let me back in to the church? This is Jesus tenderly pleading for us to let us, to let him back into our hearts, to not put him on the sidelines, but make him the center of our affections and our life, to rest on him, not on ourselves. Notice that Jesus promises to re-enter. There's no reluctance here. It's a wonderful invitation if this letter convicts you this evening, if, you, if it's convicting us as a church. Yes, you may have wondered. Yes, lukewarmness may be your condition. But it says to us, well, all is not lost. Such is the grace of God. He will re-enter. He is not lukewarm towards us. Not only will he enter, he says he will eat with us. Whenever you read of God eating with his people in the Bible, it's a, a wonderful picture of acceptance, of fellowship, of friendship, of intimacy. In other words, there's no reluctance on God's part. He is more than keen to come back in. But they've got to do something. This door needs to be opened. A response is required. These promises are dependent on repentance, on this church confessing their coldness, calling upon him afresh. And that's what you need to do this evening if this convicts you. Yeah, I've, I've strayed, I've wandered. I've, you know, I, my heart has grown cold or lukewarm. Don't simply walk out of here feeling guilty, not feeling bad for a day or two and then sort of carrying on as before. Seek the Lord earnestly. Turn to him in prayer this evening. Make a commitment to do things differently. Say, Lord, in your strength and enabling, warm up my heart. Say, right, I'm going, to, I'm going to change the way I do things. I'm going to make you a priority. I'm going to make time and your word a priority each day. I'm going to make prayer a priority. I'm going to make the fellowship of God's people a priority. I'm going to commit myself to use my gifts, not stand on the sidelines, but get stuck in. Not give you the leftovers to put Jesus back at the center of your life, to make him king. Notice Jesus is not finished with his promises. He has another for us in verse 21. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Now that's quite a promise, isn't it? Jesus won't just eat with us. He says we will reign with him. Now this promise gets read in different ways, depending on how you understand later chapters of Revelation, whether you think there's a literal millennial reign to come on earth or not, a thousand year reign and so on. We'll get there eventually towards the end of the book. But either way, Jesus is saying this, the one who is in him has everything that he has. Following him may come at a cost now. It will involve sacrifice. The Christian may not be prosperous. Choosing to put Jesus center may mean you don't keep up with the Joneses next door. You know, that you don't keep up with your work colleagues. You don't take the same holidays as them or, or do the same things because you've decided to prioritize other things. It may cost you. It will cost you in certain ways. But in Christ, you have real wealth and real position. That's the point he's making because Jesus is saying, I've conquered sin. I've conquered Satan. I've conquered death. And if you're in me, you've conquered as well. You're victorious and you will reign with me. Once again, Jesus is pointing out our dependence on him. He is our creator. He is our sustainer. He is the conqueror. 
We depend on him for life now. We depend upon him for life to come. Jesus wants this church, he wants us to see clearly once again who he is and to love him dearly. That's, that's the key thing. That's why at the start of Revelation, the focus is all on Jesus, who he is, his might, his majesty, his greatness, his grace. So often in the book of Revelation, things get sidetracked because we get interested in dates and times and places and so on. And we miss the point. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about his magnificence, his majesty, his might, his power. He says, well, if you want your heart restirred, look at me. See me afresh. Understand who you worship. See what I've done for you. We may be lukewarm towards Jesus, but he is never lukewarm towards us. Hence this letter. It's full of the grace of God, as each one is. It's meant to warm our hearts as much as it sort of cuts us in various ways. It's meant to heal as well, to make us zealous for Christ once again. I think this last letter is a very relevant for the church in the UK. And once again, it finishes with that same call, that, that echo we've had in each letter, verse 22. Have we really listened to what God is saying in this letter, in all seven of the letters? Are we sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit? Now, our plans for next Sunday have changed. We, we planned for Neil to be with us. That's no longer the case. He was going to be preaching morning and evening. I want us to do something a little bit different next Sunday night. I want us to use the opportunity to pause on our journey through Revelation and to reflect on these seven letters together to meditate on what we've heard, to pray them in. It's good, isn't it, sometimes to stop and think, well, Lord, what are you saying? We could keep going, and we will keep going, but maybe it's, this is a good juncture to stop and say, Lord, what, what are you saying to us through these letters? What, in what ways do we need to hear? What's the Spirit saying to three bridges? And so next Sunday, we're going to prioritize prayer. Perhaps we'll read through all seven again. Uh, we'll have communion together, but we'll give a priority to prayer to seek the Lord and say, Lord, what have you said to us? What do we need to hear? I encourage you to read those letters again yourself before next Sunday if you can. And if the Lord is speaking to you through, through this letter or a previous one, do something. It's been that continual message and call to repentance. That's the way of life for the Christian, not just something we do at the start, but it's often needed at other points because we we get distracted, we, we go off track. Jesus says, repent, return, rejoice in me, rejoice in your savior, because I am not lukewarm towards you. I love you zealously. My love is persistent, it's consistent, it's steadfast in a way that so often ours isn't. Don't be lukewarm towards him because he's never lukewarm towards us. Let me pray now that the Lord indeed would help us as we, we, we pause and um, pray together next Sunday that we would be searched by the word of God and helped. And indeed we would be growing in warmth towards Jesus as a church. Let's pray. Father God Almighty, we do confess that at various times in our walk we do grow cold in our affections, that we become forgetful of all that we have received and all that we are, that our gaze turns to other things and our hearts are drawn to other things. Lord, you see all of that perfectly. These letters reveal that, that nothing is hidden from you, that you know your people perfectly. Lord, search us, show us from these letters what we should be hearing. Grant us the encouragement we need, the comfort we need, but also the rebuke that we need to hear. Show us what practical steps we need to do as part of any repentance, personally or collectively. Help us indeed to have you at the center of this church, that we would not be simply a church in name, but indeed would have worship that is with you at the center, that is sincere and joyful and reverent. Holy Spirit, we do pray that you would be at work amongst us as we reflect on your word, both now and in the week to come. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.